Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Sadhguru here. I'm sure that all of you must be wondering that uh, what is this session all about? You have two Indians on the panel, one <laughs> a spiritual master and another a business person. And what are they doing here early in the morning at St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, which is all about economy, about business, about networking. And the topic is ambition to vision. I'm sure it is going to be a very interesting one. It will be participative. It will give you different perspectives in life, which is not only about business, because business has to be holistic. And so therefore, this will give you a perspective which is different, where you can conduct your day-to-day -day life in business, in whatever that you do. I would like to start with the introduction of Sadhguru. Most of you know about him, you have read about him, you have heard of him on the YouTube and many other forums. He is a spiritual master, a motivational speaker, author, philanthropist. Sadhguru has spoken at the United Nations Millennium World Peace Summit in 2000 and has also addressed the World Economic Forum four years in a row from 2006 to 2009. A prof prolific author, he has spent over 100 titles in different languages. Sadhguru is a mystic and yogi who is one of the most revered persons in the world. Sadhguru graduated with a bachelor's degree in English literature and after college, Sadhguru embarked on a career as a businessman and that is how he is here at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. He started multiple businesses including a poultry farm, brickwork and a construction business and was a successful businessman by the time he was in his mid-20s. But then in 1982, at the age of 25, he had a spiritual experience that made him realize that he had to reevaluate his life and priorities. He was sitting on a rock in Chamundi Hill in Mysore in India, south of India, when he had a very intense spiritual experience that lasted about four and a half hours that changed the course of his life. In 1983, he started conducting yoga classes in Mysore. In 1992, Sadhguru founded the Isha Foundation, a non-profit organization with an objective of offering yoga programs around the world. Today, the foundation has over 5 million volunteers and offers yoga programs not only in India, but also in countries like United States, England, Lebanon, Singapore, Canada, Malaysia, and now Russia has also been included. Over time, the foundation has also become actively involved in various social and community development activities. It works in tandem with international bodies like the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. In 2003, the foundation established Action for Rural Rejuvenation, which aims to benefit 70 million people in 54,000 villages across the state of Tamil Nadu in South India. Under Project Green, ha Green Hands, the foundation aims to plant 114 million trees throughout Tamil Nadu and increase the forest cover in the state to 33%. Unlike many other gurus, Sadhguru does not believe in providing answers to the questions. Rather, rather he believes in assisting the seekers to find answers on their own. This unconventional style has endeared him to the masses and resulted in a huge number of followers. What impresses me most about Sadhguru is his ability to bring, to break down complex problems into very simple parts and then facilitate the person to find out solutions for himself, even the, but then to give solutions to people. He adds his hallmark wit and wisdom to every conversation, which provides a different dimension, making it a memorable experience for every listener. So friends, ladies and gentlemen, I, all, I request you all with a show of hands, with a clap, to welcome what Sadhguru. Sadhguru, I will start with some questions. 
and uh, let it be like a conversation. You can please give your views because we would like to hear more from you than to ask questions. My first question to you would be, Sadhguru, you are an extremely revered and world acclaimed mystic and a spiritual leader. Mystical is having an experience in discovering truths that are beyond human understanding. Could you please share with, your, with us your discovery of yourself and the human understanding? You're being uh, very ambitious. <laughs> this is about uh, ambition to vision. Good morning, everybody. Hello, I said good morning. I thought you're not on talking terms with me already. <clears throat> See, we must, uh, for this question that you're asking, we must understand what is the basis of human experience right now. The way you know the world and yourself, is only because of the five sense perceptions of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. This is the way you know the world and this is the way you know yourself also. Right now, if you doze off, if you fall asleep, don't do it, okay? In case you fall asleep, Suddenly, the first thing is, I will disappear in your perception. And then, if you go more, the world will disappear. If you go further, even you will disappear. Well, you are there, the world is there, I am here, but in your experience, everything will disappear simply because the five sense organs have shut down. So your entire experience of life, including yourself, is happening because… only because of five sense organs. So these senses are very good instruments for one's survival. But if you want to know the nature of life, they are no good because they only give you a comparative perspective with everything. You know what is light only because you have seen darkness. You know what is sound only because you have felt silence. You know what is red only because you've seen the other color. Everything is only in comparison because the feeder, which is the sense organs, right now if you see this part of my hand, you cannot see this part of my hand. This is so with everything. If you take even a grain of sand, you can see only one part of it. So always with bits and pieces of information, you are trying to make the whole. The whole will not happen that way. This kind of information is good for survival process. It will help you to survival on, survive on this planet. But this will not allow you to know the nature of life. For example, what do you call an owl in Russian? Owl, the bird owl. What is that? Sava. So, if you and an owl sit together and start an argument as to which is light and which is darkness, where will it go? Where will it go? Endless argument. I am asking who is right, you or the owl? Hmm? Who is right, you or the owl? Hello? Both? No. See, you learn to say both either because uh, you're in the diplomatic corps or you have a successful marriage. In these two areas, you just have to learn to say both, both for everything. But the fact is, either you can be right or the owl can be right or both can be wrong, but both cannot be right. Um, we are talking about which is light and which is darkness. What I see is light or what the owl sees is right. It is just that the owl's eyes are designed for his survival. 
Your eyes are designed for your survival. Both of us are not seeing the reality of what it is. Human being, of all the creatures on the planet, we are supposed to be the peak of evolution on this planet. And this is the reason we have er added the term being to human. When we said being, what it means is we know how to be. That's one thing most human beings are not displaying right now. But actually what this means is, we have the necessary intelligence and awareness and consciousness to know how to be. If we knew how to be, the instruments of perception within us, which is beyond survival, would be open to us. Because most human beings are only busy doing something all the time. Even now, many of you are messaging something to somebody. You think this is some kind of intellectual circus, but what you're missing out is you have stopped being a human being. A human being means you know how to be. If you knew how to be, then your perception would rise beyond five senses. Then you would perceive life the way it is, not the way it is necessary for your survival alone. So essentially, when human beings move from the mode of survival to the mode of direct perception, then you see things that you never saw before. They were always there, but you did not see it. So what does it mean to be a mystic? Uh, being a mystic means uh, one day suddenly you realize what a bloody fool you have been all your life. Yes, because something that was always there, you did not see it and today you saw it. You feel like a fool, but everybody else worships you as a mystic. That's the anomaly in the world <laughs> So, but uh, Sadhguru, they are all of us and you know so many people, we spend our entire lives trying to find out that what is the reason for this existence of ours, trying to discover. I thought you spent your life making money, come on <laughs> <laughs> That's… but still when we go inside our being as you mentioned, we try to this, try to find out that what is the reason for this exi existence. You are a very successful businessman at the age of when you are in your mid-twenties. You must be having a lot of ambition. So what was it which converted your ambition into a vision and you moved from being a business person into a motivational speaker, a mystic, the realization which you had. And when you went on this journey of self-enlightenment, how do you think that you can share this with us that whether we want to, many of us would like to see that how we can create a balance between our spiritual being or realization what we are and also the business that we are in and how we can conduct that, so both ambition and vision. <coughs> see, as human beings, uh, wherever you are, you want to be something more than what you are right now. If you know only money, you're thinking more money. If you know wealth, you're thinking more wealth. If you know power, you're thinking more power. If you know knowledge, you're thinking of more knowledge. If you know pleasure, you're thinking of more pleasure. Whatever may be your currency, essentially every human being is longing to be something more than what they're right now. If that something more happens, of course something more. If that something more happens, of course something more. Suppose uh, I make you, Hemant, the king of this planet. Now, don't look at me hopefully. <laughs> I will not commit such a blunder. But suppose I make you the king of this planet or the ladies, if I make you the queen of this planet, would you be fulfilled? Might look at uh, how to be the emperor of uh, Mars the also. The solar system and the universe and the many galaxies, if you get ten galaxies, the remaining another thousand galaxies. So it is in the very nature of human being wanting to expand. How much expansion will settle you for good? If you look at this carefully right now, you will see you want a limitless expansion. Or somewhere there is a longing within you to become boundless. So once you understand your longing is not for more, 
your longing is for infinite. You want infinite expansion, a tremendous goal. But through what means are you approaching this? Your desire is fantastic. You want to expand infinitely, it's a fantastic desire. But what means are you employing this to get there? Well, let's say you're driving your car, whatever, a BMW or a Mercedes or whatever, and you saw the moon and you felt like going there. Maybe sometimes the advertisements will encourage you, use your right leg a lot and you'll get to the moon. If you try very hard, you may go beyond the moon but you will not get to the moon with a car. <laughs> if you want to go to the moon, you need a completely different kind of vehicle. So right now, through physical means, I'm saying physical means because everything that you know through five sense organs, you can see, hear, smell, taste and touch, only that which is physical in nature. When we say physical, the physical is possible in the universe only because of a defined boundary. If, if there is no defined boundary, there cannot be physical. We call this a physical body because there is a defined boundary. If you remove the boundaries of this body, it is no more physical in nature. Physicality, whether it is the smallest or the largest, there are boundaries. Without boundary, there is no physicality. Right now, as we looked at this, you have a longing to become boundless. This means you have a longing to touch a dimension which is beyond physical nature. Touching this dimension beyond physical nature is unfortunately today described by the most corrupted word called spirituality. <laughs> Spiritual process does not mean looking up or looking down. Spiritual process means you touch a dimension beyond physical within yourself. Because once you touch a dimension beyond the physical, the longing to expand is gone because the boundaries are gone. Right now you imprison yourself and try to expand. You identify yourself with the limitations of your body and then try to expand. So the most fundamental thing that one has to do if they want to really go in this direction is, this is a fundamental process in the yogic process is, first thing is you do not identify with your knowledge. Because your knowledge, whatever it may be, if you have read the libraries on the planet, still your knowledge in cosmic scale, it is a minuscule. How much ever you know, it is just a minuscule. But our ignorance is boundless. <laughs> so we always start, the first step of yogic process is, you begin to identify with your ignorance, you begin to identify with what you do not know. What you do not know is a limitless process. Because human mind essentially works around the identities that we have taken, if you identify with your knowledge, only you think you're great, other people see that you're conceited. Because you have identified with your limitations, it looks like a great thing for you, but people around you who observe you closely, they see this is a big problem. The moment you're identified with your ignorance, you have set the gates open so that always your intelligence is working towards a limitless expansion. If you are looking at a limitless expansion, not incremental expansion, that is called vision. If you are doing a constipated version of that, that's called ambition. So that means that as people, they discover themselves, they develop themselves, then from ambition, which is having boundaries, they move into a boundaryless world and that is vision. So would it be right in understanding it in simple terms like that or it is too simple? See, it's like this. Suppose uh, we imprison you in a five by five cubicle. 
you will desperately want to become free from this. So tomorrow we will give you freedom into a ten by ten cubicle. You will feel wonderful just for one day. And again you'll feel horribly imprisoned. We will release you into a hundred by hundred cubicle. You'll feel great for three days. Again you'll be in the same condition. It does not matter where I set the boundary. The moment you realize there is a boundary, there is something within you which wants to break the boundary. There is something within you which doesn't like boundaries. So are you going to address it in installments and spend your life wasting your time thinking the next boundary is going to be the ultimate boundary or will you sit here and understand right now that whatever the size of the boundary, I will feel constrained. Once you understand this, you understand that you have to explore a dimension beyond physical, otherwise you will always be in some kind of boundary. Even the planet is a boundary, even the solar system is a boundary, even a galaxy is a boundary, there is something within you. When we were just walking, when the only mode of transportation were our legs, our fifty miles was like a limitless space. Once we started driving automobiles, a thousand miles was like a limit limitless space. Once we started flying airplanes, ten thousand miles was a limitless space. Once Mr. Yuri came, <laughs> now a million miles is still not a limitless space, isn't it? So, it depends on your capability. As you get empowered, you find however large the boundary is, it is still a limitation. So only lack of empowerment gives you this thing that small boundary to big boundary is going to settle my problems, it is not going to settle. And because human life is a limited amount of time, if you go in these installments, nobody ever gets to infinite nature through installments. It is like counting one, two, three, four, five, and one day I will get to infinity. No, you will only become endless counting. So this is the way of ambition, that you will become an endless counting, and in the end, you still don't have the number that you want. So I think that basically when we are talking about the human boundaries and the way that we think about it, it's all limited by our thinking. Similarly now, you know, on the planet, all the leaders about 10, 15, 20 years back, they started the drive towards globalization. And now we see that some of the countries are wanting to recoil <laughs> and say that globalization is not the right thing to do. In our ancient scriptures in India, we have always believed in Vasudev Kutumbakam. That means the whole va world is one particular family and globalization was talked about thousands of years back. Now there's, there is a movement towards going back, looking within the country, just protecting the country and do deglobalization. So do you think in this particular world where we are talking about businesses, we are talking about human to get unfettered and start thinking beyond boundaries to go back and do, do deglobalization and get into their own countries with protection, is it a right thing and how would you suggest that what should be the way forward. Can I tell you a story? There is a story in the yogic lore. A monkey slipped into somebody's house and found a jar full of nuts with a very narrow neck. So it put its hand and grabbed so many nuts, tried to come out, the hand was stuck, all it has to do is drop a few nuts, but it's ambitious. Not willing to drop those few nuts, pulled and pulled but the hand won't come out. Another senior monkey came and said, you drop all the nuts, listen to me, just drop it. He said, no. He said, just drop all the nuts, get your hand out. So he dropped all the nuts, got the hands out. Together, both of them picked up the jar and turned it around, all the nuts came out for them to eat. There is… there is scientific evidence that monkeys are evolving. 
there is no such evidence about human beings. <laughs> they keep going up and down because with a human being, nature has left a lot of it in our hands because we are the most conscious life on this planet. For all the creatures, nature has drawn two lines. For the human being, there's only a bottom line, there's no top line. So, are we going to just bounce like ping-pong balls up and down or are we going to rise? This is a question mark. So, individual human beings, when they're driving leadership situations, some will drive it up, some will drive it down. It doesn't matter what policies you're seeing today, political policies, which come from their own fear of maintaining their political powers and positions, of uh, controlling borders, building walls, sanctions, variety of things to divide. All these things will fail simply because of technology. Because technology has no borders. Technology is going to go all over the place. And it doesn't matter, you think you belong to this nation, but your communication and your transaction, where it is in the world, you do not know, okay? So, uh, it is a certain phase. It is not that the world is moving back to control. No, it is not so. Well, when uh, people who have been in a position of advantage, when they feel their advantage is slipping away, they are making some corrections, or so they think. But that won't last long. So globalization then is an irreversible process. So I think that that is not going to go back. And now with the age of internet and with broadband speed, that everyone wants things to be done instantaneously. And especially the new generation which is coming up, and the older generation people are still grappling with and getting used to that instantaneous world. But whereas the new world, the new generation, they want everything because it is all SMSs, WhatsApp, internet. So the whole world is moving at that particular speed. And therefore, the ambition which the younger generation, they have to achieve something very quickly and fast is also causing a lot of stress to people. Because when they are not able to achieve, then they have despondency, they become depressed, they commit suicides, or they get into drugs and drinking. So what is your suggestion that how does a person balance this speed along with and the eagerness to achieve something very quickly and the time that it will take because it's a natural and normal course? So how would you suggest that people should live their lives? See, one thing is uh, very clear because of this online globalization, even if physical boundaries are still not removed, on the net, it is globalized. Because of this, you will see across the world, youth, particularly below twenty-five years of age youth, you will see a whole lot of them are not ambitious in the sense that your generation was. They are not thinking, what can I do for myself? They like to anyway wear their trousers torn. They're not thinking of, you know, <laughs> expensive clothing. They just have to buy an old pair of trousers and tear it up and it's pretty fashionable. So they are always thinking about these days, their aspiration is how to make a difference. This is a significant change in the world. You will see the younger generation is not thinking about how to make a living, they are thinking about how to make a difference because when you were growing up, making a living was a huge challenge. Now making a living is not a challenge at all. And further, in the next fifteen, twenty years' time, you will see making a living will not even be a challenge for most human beings on the planet. I hope that happens very quickly for the whole world. When making a living is not a challenge, you will see the human focus is towards they want to make a difference. Well, this wanting to make a difference need to be curated over a period of time. There is a lot of wild ideas there, but I think they will trim themselves as time goes by, as practical and impractical is sieved through. 
things will happen. But you will see among the youth, a whole lot of youth are thinking how to make a difference, not how to earn a living, which is a very positive change. This means the world is moving towards definitely from ambition to vision. <laughs> So we see that in the next generation and as we go by the years, because also there's a theory that everything in, on this planet is available in abundance, so there's no shortage. So therefore the business economics, the way that people conduct their businesses and they plan that because earlier the planning used to be always there that there are shortages and how to deal with it. So therefore the economics and the pricing policy used to be very different. But if you talk about a world where there are no short shortages, there is a lot of abundance, then the pricing policy, the business mechanics and dynamics will also be very different and will change. So what is your view about this world which is of abundance or are there shortages or are we not being able to utilize the resources in a proper and optimized way? <clears throat> the human societies, uh for last many millennia have always been structured around scarcity of something, scarcity of food, scarcity of housing, clothing, all the things that we normally need on a day-to-day -day basis, always it's been scarce. In any given society, everybody having access to all of it is rare. Always one set of people have access to it, another set of people don't have access to it. Well, these entire uh, philosophies of uh, economics, of communism, other things came up because of haves and have-nots. If there was no haves and have-nots, no such philosophy would be needed because the number of have-nots were overwhelmingly more than the number of, number of haves. That is why this some kind of balancing act became a necessity. So. If abundance comes, what becomes most significant is responsible usage. That is what becomes most significant aspect of human life. Everything is available in abundance, but how do we use it? Responsible usage becomes the key element, which is what we are trying to work towards, responsible usage of everything. Right now on 5th of uh, June, Worldwide, we are launching a campaign on ban on single-use plastics. Plastic, though, it's one of the most phenomenal material that we have created, which can be recycled over a thousand times, if you wish, or a million times, if it's properly maintained. Unfortunately, it has become the scourge of this world. Today, people are saying, I don't know if the statistics are right, but it could be somewhere near that. They are saying by 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans than the fish. So, irresponsible usage has happened with abundance. But a time has come where responsible usage will become the key. Only then abundance will pay very positive dividend. I think definitely that awareness is beginning to happen. Not fast enough, it's never fast enough but it's beginning to move in that direction. So one simple thing we are looking at is responsible usage. When I say responsible usage, I'll tell you how simple the problem is and how complex it is at the same time. We've been… Uh, I've been assembling a group of people which we will be approaching shortly in a month or two with all the data and solutions. For example, the bottles, the pet, this is glass bottle, this is very nice. The pet bottles, the plastic bottles, we produce half a trillion, that is 500 billion bottles a year. We use them, throw them and next year again we produce 500 more, 500 billion more bottles. Some of the large companies, let's say Coca-Cola for example, it's very easy to recycle this bottle but there is a, a paper label, a label, Coca-Cola written on it. That paper label is a problem. When you… when you want to recycle, you are supposed to remove that label. How do you remove that? In India, women and children are employed to remove those labels for recycling. 
but in the rest of the world there is no such labor force. So if you recycle with the paper, the plastic gets downgraded, it can't be used as a bottle again. All you have to do is print that Coca-Cola with a biodegradable, biodegradable dye directly on the bottle. It's a very simple thing. But that simple thing won't be done till you put sufficient amount of pressure. This is the kind of challenges we have in the world. They're very simple responsibility if it comes. Responsibility is a key word for the future. I've been openly declaring this. This entire movement that what I'm doing in the world is a movement from religion to responsibility, from looking up for solutions to looking inward for solutions, both for our own individual solutions and the solutions for the world. It's time we looked at ourselves as more responsible creatures because abundance is coming. If along with abundance there is irresponsibility, then that's going to be disastrous. So that is the key element we need to change, a more conscious way of existence. So I think that it makes, uh, as we understand what you are mentioning and saying, that it makes more sense for businesses to make their models more responsive, more responsible, and seeing that how they are in a position to contribute towards also the development of the society and not to, not to damage that. It's so, a balance is very important. But that is where it is a very difficult task because a balance for someone may be different for, for, from the perspective of balance for someone else. So how, what are your simple, your, what are the simple solutions that you would <laughs> provide for balancing the life for a person, both from the perspective of the business and also being responsible to society and to be in a position to contribute in a positive manner? So I wouldn't... Uh... I wouldn't encourage you towards balance because everybody will claim that they are doing a balanced thing. That's not the solution. For example, I said this, you know, bottle, bottle example. It doesn't take a genius to understand that paper and plastic will not mix in recycling. Why is it that I have to point this out to you? Why is it that you do not know? Is it because you lost the balance of your mind? So everybody's talking about we used coal, then we used oil, then we used something else, nuclear, and now we are saying, oh, solar is the solution. Why? We have always been a solar-powered life. The very planet is solar-powered. Why is it that we are not looking at it? We have to go through this entire process of destruction and then when our life is threatened, we will look at it. Does it take a genius to understand that right now, you have just come out of winter in Russia into summer, does it take a genius to understand this heating is provided by solar energy? Hello? Does it take some kind of a scientific genius or any sensible man, if he looked up, he knows he wants the sun to come up and it makes a difference? So the only thing was technology of converting that into usable force. That's all that was needed. It would not have taken 100, 150 years for us to recognize this. Recognition would have happened the first ray of light after winter. You would have known, isn't it? Everybody knew how to make it into technology make, make certain amount, may take certain amount of time. So what we need is not balance. What we need is clarity of vision that we see things for what they are. Well, it may take some time to develop those things, that's fine. But we must see things clearly as they are, isn't it? Is it very difficult to understand that you and me and everybody else here or just a piece of this planet right now sitting here? Hello? Or do we have to bury you? Only then you will understand you are a part of the planet. Which way is it? But most people understand only when you bury them. Till then they won't understand, that's a problem. So what is needed is clarity. Once we have clarity, action will take some time, that's okay. So as they also now talk about the God's particle and the quantum biology on matter, energy, so, and you know, there are a lot of uh, theories which are going on, a lot of theses which are being written on it. 
And so there was somewhere people say that you know there is a God particle, and human beings have come from there, and therefore it also confounds and confuses people that whether there is a God, there is no God, whether you have to follow spirituality. Some people have very simple meaning for spirituality that once they have a couple of drinks, they are in high spirits, then they feel that spirituality has evolved on them. So basically, how do you define this God particle and because science and God particles are being combined together, so... He, he is complimenting Russians saying you are very spiritual. No. You get it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Let, as I already defined this, what you're referring to as spiritual is a dimension beyond the physical. Is it true, as you sit here, everything that's physical about you, you gathered from outside, is the true? Hello? I'm asking all of you. This physical body is just the food that you've eaten. The food that you've eaten is just a piece of this planet, isn't it? You gathered this slowly, you did not drop from heaven just like this. So what is physical about you is an accumulation from outside. Whatever you accumulate, at the most you can cl claim it is mine. You cannot say it's me. So if you know you gathered physicality, you must be something more than that. That something more unfortunately got labeled as spirit, <laughs> all right? <laughs> So that's gone distorted and now it's stored in a bottle, I understand that. <laughs> but if you touch a dimension beyond physical nature within yourself, this is a spiritual process. Spiritual process does not mean looking up because first of all, I want you to understand we are on a round planet and the damn thing is spinning all the time. If you look up, inevitably you're looking up in the wrong direction. You not only not looking up, you are incapable of knowing what is up or what is down in this cosmos. Is it somewhere in this cosmos marked, this is… this side is up? There is no such thing. Then what will you do? Russians are looking up, what will you do with Australians? How will they look up? So there is no up and down. So looking up, looking down is all fear-driven. Because of fear and uncertainty, we have uh, done some certain things. Talking about the God particle, God particle <laughs> or the Higgs boson as it's called, it's an… you know, it's a yeah. boss from your state, yes. <laughs> but it's become a boson, what to do? Now, uh, we must understand that all these things are just footprints. Actually, the scientists themselves are describing it as a footprint. They have not seen the real thing, they only see the footprint. I must tell you from my experience, when I was in the university, I volunteered to do tiger census in the southern Indian forests. Every year there's an opportunity like this that along with the forest department, they will give you a certain area where you go and count the number of tigers in the forest. It's a very interesting affair for a young person. So I went there, spent a few months in the jungle. <laughs> All we saw is the pug mark. By reading the pug mark, taking the image of it, size of it, we say, okay, it is this same tiger walking in two different places. By looking at another pug mark, we say, okay, this is a male tiger, this is a female tiger, like this we go about. It doesn't matter how many hundreds of pug marks you have seen, when you face the real tiger, all these pug marks vanish from your head. <laughs> That's the experience. So it doesn't matter how many footprints of these things, creation and the source of creation you have seen, when you encounter the real thing, all this will vanish. It will, believe me. As you mentioned about, uh, you know, you were brave enough to go and uh, get into the forest for the tigers, but everyone would have that fear that if they get in, they might be killed by the, by the tigers. So therefore, there is this guilt, anger, hatred, 
fear which is there inside every person and you have also mentioned in your books and also when you have had discussion with people and uh, taken classes how to manage this guilt anger hatred fear is it coming out of some kind of a deep down you know something which is disturbing people it's insecurity and how to overcome that now you're becoming very european <laughs> Because this whole psychoanalysis, you're trying to analyze your problems. There's a simpler way to look at it. It's just this. If your mind, if your mind took instructions from you, I'll repeat this again to all of you, if your mind took instructions from you, would you keep this mind joyful or miserable. You must choose right now, I'm going to bless you. Joyful, isn't it? For yourself, it's very clear, you want the highest level of pleasantness. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but for yourself, it's hundred percent clear that you want the highest level of pleasantness. Why such a simple desire is not being fulfilled? Simply because you have not taken charge of your body, nor your mind, nor your chemistry, nor your emotional structures, because fundamentally you have not read the user's manual for a very complex machine called human mechanism. Without reading the user's manual, you're blundering through it. And then you're thinking, why is anger coming? Why is misery coming? Why is frustration coming? Why is stress coming? <laughs> These are all different expressions of the same thing. Your mind is not taking instructions from you. Is it very clear today from modern medicine that every human experience has a chemical basis to it? So joy is one kind of chemistry, misery is another kind of chemistry, stress is one kind of chemistry, tranquility is another kind of chemistry, agony is one kind of chemistry, ecstasy is another kind of chemistry. Or in other words, this is one big chemical soup. The question is only, are you a great soup or a lousy soup? That's all the question is. If I give ten people the same soup making ingredients, do you believe they will turn out the same kind of soup? So why has a lousy soup come? No skill of soup, soup making. Yes, you did not read the instruction manual user's manual for this complex mechanism, you've been given a super, super, super computer and you don't know where the keyboard is and you're struggling with it and then you're analyzing your problems endlessly. There's no need to do all this rubbish. If your mind takes instructions from you, I'm guaranteed that you'll keep yourself blissful. I'm very sure of that. What do you think? Hello? Will you or no? Hundred percent? So therefore you have given a very simple solution that people need to have the control of themselves and if they do that, then they would be joyful and all. No, no, I did not say control. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am talking about liberation, not control. <laughs> See, people are thinking they should control their mind. No, your mind needs to be liberated from all kinds of rubbish. Because it's controlled, it's constipated. If it's constipated, it's just full of shit, okay? This is what is happening. What is needed is not control, what is needed is liberation. So fundamentally, not understanding the mechanics of life, we're trying to blindly do something with it. It's like this. Let's say you do not know how to ride a bicycle. These days, uh, bicycles are all in single stand, but you remember during yeah. your time there was a stand where the back wheel is up. So you sat on a bicycle and just pedaling a standing bicycle. But suddenly it came off the stand and started rolling. Stressed out or no? Hmm? Yes, because you don't know how to ride. It started moving faster, fear or no? It started going very fast, terror or no? Yes, but if you knew how to ride the bicycle, faster it went, more wonderful it is. Right now that's a whole thing with people. 
if life doesn't happen fast enough for them, they are frustrated. If it happens faster, they are terrorized. Tell me what's the solution? Tell me one thing that human beings are not suffering. If they are poor, they are suffering their poverty. You make them rich, they suffer the taxes. If they are not educated, they suffer that. Put them to school, non-stop suffering. They are not married, they suffer that. Get them married. I did not say anything, ladies are laughing. Tell me one thing that they are not suffering. So they are not suffering life. They are not suffering life, they are suf suffering their own faculties. What happened ten years ago, you can still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, you already suffer. This does not mean you are suffering life. You are suffering two most fantastic faculties of being human, which is a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. You suffer what happened ten years ago, you suffer what may happen day after tomorrow. This means you are suffering your memory and your imagination, you are not suffering your life. So, what is the solution? The solution, as you said, is spiritual. You drink odka. <laughs> Half your brain is frozen, then you feel good. So, what you are saying is, if you lose your faculties, then you will be fine. We can as well remove half your brain and you will feel great, believe me. I was… I was in Mysore in southern India. I was just entering a building to see someone and an old lady who's over seventy-five years of age, a small built lady, she came to me with a big wonderful smile on her face and said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing wonderful ma'am, how are you doing? And she went about. I don't forget people's faces, I don't record their names, but I never forget faces. So I don't know this lady, but then I went up and after about twenty, thirty minutes I come back. Again she comes up to me and with a big smile on her face, she says, how are you doing? A little weird, just now you asked me. But then again I said, I'm doing wonderful. Then somebody next to me explaining to me, oh, it's very unfortunate the lady has lost her memory. I said, she's doing fine, she's doing great, she's… I don't think she smiled like this all her life. Now because she's lost her faculty of memory, she smiles wonderfully. So for most people who are not even able to sit in one place peacefully, if you remove half their brain, they will sit peacefully. The problem is, with the problem that you have created, you have also destroyed the possibility. If you destroy possibilities, you will be peaceful. If you're dead, you will be very peaceful. This happened, I must tell you. Uh, Shankaran Pillai, you heard of him, yes. an Indian man, met his friend from twenty-five years ago in the university, suddenly they met after twenty-five years. So he invited him home for dinner. The friend came for dinner and uh, Shankaran Pillai's wife was serving the dinner. Every time Shankaran Pillai needs something, he uh, refers to his wife as my honey, my sweetie pie, my darling and uh, coo, coo coo my bo bo bo, my bul bul, whatever. I don't know what you say in Russian. Then after the dinner is over, the friend is leaving and the friend said, you are having an amazing life, aren't you? Shankaran Pillai said, what are you talking about? He said, see, I have been married for fifteen years, we can barely look at each other. But the way, the endearments with which you are referring to your wife as my honey, my sweetie pie, my coo coo, -coo my bo bo bo, all this, Shankaran Pillai said, have you lost your mind? Oh man, I forgot her name seven years ago <laughs> So if you lose your faculties, sweetness will come out of you, very unfortunate. When everything is good, you must be wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> That's not happening simply because the complexity of human existence you have not learned to handle. 
you are hoping that if you were like an earthworm you would be peaceful yes if you had the brain of an earthworm you would be very peaceful i must tell you this just this month about 4 5 weeks ago a television anchor in southern india committed suicide by jumping off a fifth floor window she fell and she died young woman just 34 years of age she left a note i hold nobody responsible for my death and in block letters she wrote because this went viral on the indian television and everywhere she wrote in block letters my brain is my enemy these are her words your brain is the great greatest gift you have is your brain right now but your brain is your enemy simply because you did not read the user's manual how to use it this is why inner engineering <laughs> right now we are going about spreading this inner engineering this just means you have the user's manual how to engage this body how to engage this brain so that it works for you not against you you must understand you may call it stress you may call it anxiety and all the other horrible things you said about anger hatred jealousy this just means your brain is working against you that's all when it will kill you we don't know but, but you but usually people say that you know they don't use their brains and as it is human beings they use their brains anywhere between 10% to 40% to the max so as you mentioned that you know there is a scope for taking out some part of the brains and people will feel, be happier and joyful i think that 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 should be the solution so we need to go to doctors and find out some surgical no, operation this is, through this is this is fascist <laughs> <laughs> take out people's brains they will be happy <laughs> no all possibility of human will be lost if you take out the brains this is the biggest asset we have compared to other creatures you are not as ferocious and strong as a tiger or an elephant or something but we dominate this planet we got brains but now you have not learned to use it for you you're using it against yourself if you use it for yourself and for everything else around you if human intelligence works for the well-being of life on this planet believe me in a very brief time we'll find solutions for everything that you're facing on the planet right now largely it's working against them so the users manual is something which is important yes that's people. what i'm trying to give you <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming back to the ambition and the vision part of it usually ambition is usually connected with sense of arrogance deceit that people are greedy so that is what ambition is all about whereas vision seems to be more worthy and noble and when this topic was chosen from ambition to vision so would it be right or appropriate to say that it is basically from greed or from arrogance that you are moving to a better path or moving higher up into achieve being more noble and more worthy in whatever a person wants to fulfill or these are just words which has been misconstrued and misconceived um people who think they are noble and they are morally right and correct are the most conceited people on the planet those who think they are very good or insufferable you can't even be with them so essentially let's define ambition and vision like this ambition is exclusive vision is inclusive that's all do not go into any other qualities it is inclusive and inclusiveness is everything inclusiveness is not a philosophy or an ideology that i took up or you take up this is the nature of life when you breathe you are including you cannot help right now you may not like somebody who is sitting here but unknowingly what they're exhaling you're inhaling isn't it there is no problem there is no problem with life exclusivity has come only on the level of your intellect rest of the life has really no issue about exclusiveness rest of the life is anyway inclusive everything about life is inclusive only your intellect is exclusive because you have forgotten how to use your discriminatory intellect 
When I say you've forgotten how to use your discriminatory intellect, if I ask you a question, would you want your intellect to be sharp or blunt? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now. You want your intellect sharp or blunt? Hello? Sharp. So you understand your intellect is like a knife, it's a cutting instrument. Knife is good to cut, knife is good to dissect, knife is do good to open up things. But suppose this is the only instrument you have, even when you want to sew something, you use your knife to sew instead of a needle, then what you leave is tatters. This is the human condition right now, because our education systems have become purely intellectual. Now people are using their intellect even to put things together and they're making it into many more pieces because with a knife you're trying to unite, it's not going to work. So you cannot have vision with a knife. Knife is discriminatory, that's how it is. Knife will cut things into two pieces. Knife will not make two into one. It cannot do, that's not the instrument. There are other dimensions of intelligence within the human being which have never been made use of, which have never been addressed by a, by majority of the people. So this is what we want to bring, particularly to the leadership in the world, that you must access dimensions of intelligence within you which are not exclusive, which are naturally inclusive. No, I think that this is a very, very simple perspective and a very nice perspective to put down the ambition and vision and I think that it will be good for all of us to remember this and especially in our world where we are in economics and business where things seem to be very complicated. I would now, thank you Sadhguru, I would like to now uh, throw open to the floor any questions that anyone has. So just a couple of questions because we have, we'll be running against time so we have… He's to trying to be inclusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just a couple of questions. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, thank you very much for being here and uh, thank you for your uh, interesting story. Uh, my question would be um, rather personal. Uh, when you find uh, your vision, when you are on the route to your vision, to finding your vision, sometimes uh, you're already there and you see people around you who are seeking for the same thing. So in a way they are um, uh, asking for your help. And you help them and you talk about these things and you uh, refer for um, y these people to somebody like you uh, for more knowledge about this. But also you see uh, people around you who are not asking for that help, but you can see that they desperately need that. Do you think that um, it's better to leave them in peace and be as they are before they find this um, need in them to go for help? Or do you think that um, we should pursue them to find this help? Uh, hello. Okay. See, uh, it's not always a question of uh, whom you can help and you cannot help. It is just that you are a life first, then a mind. Is that so? You're living, so you have a mind, isn't it? It is not the other way round. Because you have a mind, you're living. No, you are living, so you have a mind. The nature of body is exclusive. Yes, your body is yours, my body is mine, this is exclusive. This cannot be very inclusive. The nature of our intellect also is like this. I have my thoughts and emotions, you have your thoughts and emotions, this is exclusive. It's perfectly fine. It is just that life is inclusive. So, how deeply you're identified with your body, and your thought and emotion will determine how exclusive you are. If you are identified with the life that you are, you will be naturally inclusive. So somebody else who is suffering this from their, from their own exclusiveness, exclusiveness means you built a wall for self-protection, 
and if you build a wall for self-protection, it also becomes a wall of self-imprisonment. Well, it may take some suffocation to realize its self-imprisonment, but it will come. Now you're talking about a person who doesn't seem to realize but suffering suffocation. Well, if you give them a fresh… a breath of fresh air, they will realize. So don't try to advise them, don't try to send them to me. Just see if you can smile at them, maybe hug them if they allow <laughs> or do something which is an act of inclusiveness or just the way you are. If they see you exuberant and joyful, they will look at you initially thinking, what's funny about this, what's wrong with her? But after some time, they want to be like you. That means they want to break their walls. When they want to break their walls and they don't know how, then only help. When people don't want to break their walls, if you offer help, that's going to be ridiculous, you know <laughs> Yes. Sadhguru, namaste. I'm uh, very happy to see you here. It is uh, wonderful that we can uh, listen to you and talk to you. We are talking about ambition. An ambitious man, uh, as a rule, has a very big ego. Uh, is it important to kill your own ego? But how can you do that while remaining a member of the human society, go to your office and so on? If you, uh, <laughs> if, you sh if you show me your ego, I'll kill it right now. Do you know where it is? No, I don't know, but I still feel the body and uh... That's it. So you don't know because you have never seen it. You assumed it because ego is a fall guy. You know what's a fall guy in Russian? Hmm? What's a fall guy? No? Uh, you need somebody to hang. So whenever… whenever you do wonderful things, who did it? I did it. Whenever you do something nasty, who did it? Mr. Ego, he did it. So you are working towards becoming a schizophrenic. This one thing you must fix. Within this, there is only one person. This is an individual. An individual means he is indivisible. That means he is not further divisible. You must decide right now, are, is there one person or two people inside? Only one person? Yes, that means you're healthy. If there is more than one person, it means you're either schizophrenic or you're possessed. You need either a psychiatrist or an exorcist. There is only one person here. Sometimes this person is wonderful, sometimes this person is nasty, sometimes he's absurd, sometimes he's intelligent. This is what you're seeing. So because you saw four different qualities, if you give it four different names, you will become sick. So you must see this. If you see, I'm being nasty, would you correct yourself? You definitely will. But if you see Mr. Ego is being nasty, well, you can never fix that guy because he doesn't exist. So don't invent these words. These are all Indian inventions. Don't you see? <laughs> In India we have thousand identities within you. Don't get into that mess. There is only one, just you. You, you and you alone. If you do wonderful things, it's you. If you do nasty things, it's you. If you're feeling fantastic, it's you. If you're feeling horrible, it's you. If you fix this one thing, that you are responsible for everything that you are, you will see ninety percent of your problems will disappear. Remaining ten percent, I can take care of it for you. So thank you, thank you Sadhguru. Thank you for such insightful conversation and also making things so simple for people, for people to be in a position to follow it 
and thank you everyone thank you friends ladies and gentlemen it was a great morning and i hope that you all enjoyed it and got different perspectives on life thank you thank you very much all of you <laughs>